Hello everyone, I'm Alex Mitchell. I am a soon-to-be graduate of UNC's DPT class of 2024. Today, I'm honored to bring to you an interview that's close to my heart. Dr. Frank Church is an esteemed biomedical researcher and professor, as well as a longtime mentor of mine, who I first met taking his biology of blood diseases class in undergrad. Shortly after that class ended in 2014, Frank received a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In our conversation, he thoughtfully and candidly explained his experiences, discussed his work researching his own diagnosis, and shared his appreciation for physical therapy as a crucial treatment for persons with Parkinson's. I hope this interview continues to inform and inspire future therapists, especially those with an interest in working with neurodegenerative diseases. Thanks so much for listening to our conversation. So you, you asked me a question when we were first talking about this and you asked me why Parkinson's, you know, why is this an interest of mine? And I'm, I'm still trying to remember what I told you then, but I know that my answer now, a lot of the interest came from you, just knowing I was one of your former students, I took biology of blood diseases with you, and it, it, it became something that wasn't just a nebulous condition that people have, it became something that this, studying this actually is making a difference to someone I know and someone I really enjoy being around, it became a lot more interesting. And then physical therapy, of course, plays a big role in a lot of the huge, treatment. Huge. Huge role in a huge lot of the role. treatment. Yeah. And you've taught me a lot of stuff that I would have had no idea that physical therapists could do, even working on a golf swing together oh, and yeah. doing all sorts of things too. So just as a start, tell us or tell me a little bit about yourself and your diagnosis. Are you able to tell me, too, about some of your research background in sure. molecular biology and all that? Sure. Well, actually, today, March 11th, is my 10-year anniversary of my diagnosis. Today? Today. Today. The actual day. God, that's wild. Isn't that crazy? That um, is wild. And I had this two-page letter that I wrote my neurologist because it had been two years for they made the diagnosis. Really? Yeah. I didn't know it was that long. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's like Parkinson's is made on the assessment of the patient. Mm -hmm. There's no blood test. There's no any test that tells you you've got this disorder. Right. And uh, I had had a swallowing defect. I was having breathing problems. Um, I was having uh, my neck, my whole right side was really, really stiff. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, so I went through orthopedic surgeons, I went through ENT people, I went through gastroenterologists, mm. went through cardiologists. I did a stress test and I ended up having my heart looked at mm. to see if I had any heart disease. And you, you know, cardiologist woke me up 20 minutes later and goes, your heart's beautiful, here's your picture. <laughs> Always what you like to hear when you go, you know. He goes, but I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong with you. Mm. And so my my issue has become with with physicians that are focused on their disease. They have blinders mm. on. Right. And so the GI people only look at GI issues, and uh, the, the cardiologists only looked at heart issues, mm -hmm. and and so on and so on. And so finally, this resident said, "You may have Parkinson's." Hmm. Go see a movement disorder specialist. Wow. And, and my, res my, my chief physician, like, going, you know, he's probably right. Hmm. And, but it took four months to get an appointment. Golly. And so, oh, <laughs> And you had already gone all these, through all these avenues I of already, different I mean, specialists. I, I, I and... put Dr. Google enough. If you, if you put in Google, mm -hmm. swallowing defect. The differential is always ALS. Yeah. It's always this really bad disease. <laughs> I'm like going, I know I don't have ALS. Well, I didn't think I did. And so I, I, I have this letter that I wrote to my neurologist 10 years ago today hmm. going, it's taken me four months to get here. Here's my problem. <laughs> I wonder how many patients <laughs> neurologists have that, that and, can and, do something and, like that. Just have it all listed out. Danny was great. He was great. He was a good guy. And he sat there very calmly. It took him like 15 minutes. He didn't say a word. He just read. He shook his head. He underlined some stuff on the copy I gave him. He looked at me and he did, he did, he did a few simple tests. And he goes, I got good news and I have bad news. Mm. 
good news is I can explain everything that's gone wrong with you. Hmm. The bad news is you've got Parkinson's disease. Hmm. And I knew what he was going to tell me. I just didn't, I just needed to hear it officially. Yeah. I, I had figured it out. Hmm. And uh, so I, I sat there, he did a few other exams. He said it's idiopathic. Yep, don't you know probably don't know what from. caused it. You probably have young onset because you're 59. And um, we're going to give you a dopamine agonist. Hmm. And I went to drugstore, got it filled, took my first pill, and I swear to God, 20 minutes later, half hour later, I could start, it started melting, and I could feel myself. Wow. You know, coming back. That I'd quick not and felt that, that way sudden? in two years. Wow, that's wild. It was the weirdest sensation. I mean, when the drugs start to work, depending on what, you, what your symptoms are, mm -hmm. they go away. Wow. That's usually a, that's, I mean, it sounds like it would almost be a conclusive, it would be conclusive if they knew that the agonist worked right away, mm -hmm. that that would mm -hmm. be pretty inclusive of the diagnosis. Yeah. But the agonist over the last 10 years, people have found that it has a lot of sad side reactions and yeah. they're not necessarily very good. Yeah. It leads to compulsive behavior and people gamble. I mean, I saw that Porsche in the, <laughs> Porsche it's, in the front it's yard. Ten, it's 10 years old. <laughs> I've been looking at Porsches for at least a year uh -huh. before I had my diagnosis. Justification, you know. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I've actually, I've, I've thought about that. Oh. <laughs> um, but the problem with Parkinson's is I've probably had it now 10 years my diagnosis today. Sure. I probably had it for 20 or 25 years. Really? Yeah. It, and I think back to 60, 40, you know, how old was I when I first started having these symptoms? Hmm. Because what it is is that the, your midbrain, the region making dopamine, starts to die. Mm -hmm. But it takes years and years and years for it to die. And only when you get to be 50 to 70 percent of it gone, hmm. you start getting these symptoms. That manifests more. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it takes years to, for most people to reach that point. Hmm. And uh, the scary thing is I can think back in my career, you know, when did I not get a grant funded? You know, when did something not work well? Hmm. And, and, you know, because cognitive and stress and all these things can exacerbate all your symptoms. Hmm. It would be hard not to think through, yeah. you know, so go I, back in those things. I've actually mapped my career, and I kind of have a feeling that this is about when it started. I wow. Think. Yeah. And was it fairly, was it a lot earlier on than you I would have expected? I was probably in my 30s. Really? Wow. And there wasn't, there wouldn't have been any way to do the diagnosis sooner unless... That's, just, that's, a, that's the kind of question they don't have answers to right now. Mm -hmm. it, that's okay. They need blood tests. They need markers. There are genetic markers. So 23andMe, every time they get a new gene to test, I'll get mm. an email going, you, are, you do not have this kind of Parkinson's. And hmm. so I've not found one genetic defect that I'm positive for. Interesting. And the list of 23andMe has. Wow. For genetic diseases. And they've probably kept up with some of the markers and everything that there's ongoing research yeah. for, too. But. I mean, it's actually a pretty good company because they sell all the DNA they get. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not positive for any of the Parkinson's ones? No, hmm. not, not that I know of it. And that's why it's idiopathic. Hmm. It just happened, you know, some... And, you know, I've had the conversation with my neurologist going, what about this when I was a kid? What about this when I was in hmm. grad school? He goes, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You did it. Hmm. It's uh, good that your neurologist has said, try not to worry. We're, we're in the here oh, and now. He was great because, because Frank, if you, if, even if you figure out what it was, what difference will it make? That's a good point. That's a good point. So I've got another question to you. So as a physical therapy student and one of your former students, I'd be curious to know a little bit about your experience with the disease. And you talked some about it already, but what's the specific type, if you know it, as far as the specific type of Parkinson's and what are the symptoms that impact you the most? Okay. So if we had 10 people in this room with the flu, yeah. we would all have the exact same symptoms. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you had 10 people in this room with Parkinson's, 
we would all have 10 different types of diseases. <laughs> yep. It's the most bizarre disease because it's, it's very heterogeneity to it. There's about 40 different symptoms, mm -hmm. at least. My main symptoms are I have a tremor, a small tremor in my right arm. I'm stiffer here and here on my right side okay. than on my left side. Um, my voice has changed. I, and that's that's the biggest impact for me teaching is I don't have the voice I used to have. Hmm. Kind of the projection. Yeah, I can't. Hmm. I don't. It's 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 almost monotone. Hmm. I don't have the facial expression. I've lost that. Hmm. It's good when I was on the medical admissions committee because I could interview somebody. No one could ever tell how the I was feeling. The poker face. <laughs> exactly. That's a good benefit, I suppose. I said it was awesome. <laughs> Huh, you, you know, I never could tell what you thought about me. I said, well. That's good, I guess. That's good. <laughs> that and, is funny. But, but for teaching medical school and undergrads, you want to project your voice a little bit. And it was, I had to go through something called LSVT, loud. Mm, okay. That's the very first thing I ever did. And um, it was by speech pathologist. And we went through this whole thing about reading and, and trying to, Increase the sound of your voice, hmm. and uh, I think it worked. I don't practice as much as I used to, but so I have this tremor. Um, I still have this swallowing defect. Okay. Um, every now and then, something will get stuck, hmm. which is not good. No, not generally. Um, it's usually a pill, and it'll take me a while, but I will cough it up. Hmm. Um, so it's my voice. The tremor, general stiffness, mm -hmm. and I have with, with, I have executive function problem. I'm not I can't read a map very well. Hmm. I really can't, um, and my focus is not as intense. It's not as direct as it used to be. Hmm. My mind kind of wanders. I used to be able to multitask. I, well, I used to think I used to be able to multitask, <laughs> do all these things <laughs> at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now I do it because my mind just wanders this way, and then it wanders this <laughs> way, down one and then trail, it wanders this way, and, and I'm going, oh trail. my God, what am I doing? Why am I over here? Interesting. Yeah. Now, have there been therapies that have been particularly helpful that you noticed the difference? I mean, you mentioned this, the speech, some of that. I know we're going to talk about PT at some point, yeah. too, but are there therapies or even the medicines, if there's something about the cinemat that seems to help you, too? Well, that, I mean... The good thing about Parkinson's, it's a neurodegenerative disease. And that means it's progressive and it's chronic. You can treat the symptoms, the motor symptoms, mm -hmm. the stiffness, the imbalance, the, the tremor with levodopa and carbidopa, which is the precursor to dopamine. And so I take that every four hours and it's just incredible because, like I said a few minutes ago, it, you can feel it. It melts in and turns on about hmm. 45 minutes. Hmm. You can just feel it. I'm on the golf course, and I take it in about three holes. <laughs> my court, you, you, it's amazing how your coordination gets, comes back. Hmm. And it's not so much power, but it's basically when you swing and hit something. You can see the ball. You can swing your arms. It just feels like it's... What, what it's supposed to be like. Sure, a lot more of a smooth um, motion. And then when it's going off, it's just the opposite. You can't swing. Hmm. You you feel like you've lost power, you've lost coordination. And so there's this, this balance and imbalance with this drug. And that that's the bad thing about it. Yeah. That's why, I use do that's why you can use dopamine agonist because it has a much longer half-life. Hmm. It's a much more potent drug. But again, like I said, it has it has some significant side effects. Mm -hmm. So the, the main drug I'm using is levodopa and carbidopa. The brand name is Cinnamet. Cinnamet. Mm -hmm. I take it five times a day. And my condition requires me to take a couple hundred milligrams of this pill about every four hours. And so the um, but the nothing has been found to slow down the progression of Parkinson's except for exercise. And love to hear it. Yeah. And it's been 
20, I guess 20 years ago when the physical therapists and physicians talked about it, mm -hmm. they thought exercise was bad for someone with Parkinson's because they were stiff. Mm -hmm. And that might make it worse to lift weights, to be get stiffer. <laughs> and it turns out that that's actually a good thing, you know, to, to work out and do that. I've always been an athlete. I'm now a weekend warrior. And so tackling Parkinson's has always been important to me from the exercise standpoint. And my first run in with, not run in, my first experience. <laughs> my first with, fight. With, with a physical therapist. <laughs> My was in rumble. UNC for the mm -hmm. LSVT big program. And the whole idea is that they, when Parkinson's, you, th you feel like things are normal, but in reality, things are small. Hmm. And so they want you to do things big. Yep. And so instead of reaching for that cup, I'm doing that. They want you to reach. Overreach. Over it. Yep. And do all of these exaggerated things. So you do hmm. this really exaggerated program. It was incredible. Hmm. There were maybe 10 different exercises. Okay. And we did it every day, four days, for, for an hour a day for four days a week for four weeks in a row. It was incredible. <laughs> I, I was limber, I was loose. Improved your golf game, probably. And... Yeah, it really did. <laughs> I mean, that's a ton of big movement. You wrote yeah. a paper on that. I did. Of having golf be, and, I mean, at least an adjunct therapy in many ways. Yeah, so part of, the, part of the therapy, too, was they had to get me in and out of my little car. Hmm. They said, you know, you have a small car, so you know it's going to be hard for you to get in and hmm. out of your car. Yeah. And so one of the things we did, we practiced getting out of the car, and you practiced using your muscles and, and going up and sitting down mm -hmm. because the whole idea is that you don't want to just collapse. Nope. <laughs> you want to go down slow. And intentional. That's good. Yeah. And so we did that. We did that, we did that every day. A beautiful sit to stand to sit. Right. Well done. <laughs> and then we go out in the parking lot and I go, okay, oh, you really do have a small car. Oh, oh savage. <laughs> so we had to like practice getting in and out of the car. Uh-huh. And uh, that some of it was practical like that. Yeah, of course. Some of it was actually... Um, that had me on these multi-balance things okay. to keep me imbalanced. Mm. And they had me practice my golf swing. Oh, okay. Practicing my tennis serve. Um, and cause the whole idea, one of the bad things about Parkinson's is you lose your balance. Mm -hmm. And you fall. Yeah. And one of the biggest things about getting older is increased risk of falling mm -hmm. and hurting yourself by breaking your hip. Spending extended Hemorrhage time in, in the hospital. Brain. Yeah. Yep. So people with Parkinson's disease have a ninefold increased risk of falls. Jeez, yeah. And it's just because you're imbalanced. You're, you're crooked. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm, that's one of the, I am crooked. I mean, I've, I've noticed it when I sit. <laughs> crooked I'm a, man. I'm a little bit crooked. <laughs> and that was one of the things we've, we worked on. Hmm. Just kind of knowing where your body is in space yeah. and having yeah. the balance and there, trying too. to correct it. Very cool. Um, and so the, um, let's see what else, where are we? I was about to do a, um, do a pivot a little bit because we're talking about exercise. Okay. Could talk about our exerkines review. Um, but the question that I had regarding that is that knowing that exercise seems to be at least a stop or at least a pause on some of the neurodegeneration bits, are there any molecular pathway, I mean, relating somewhat to your molecular side of things, are there any specific pathways in Parkinson's that you're finding particularly intriguing or promising hmm. as far as future research? So my understanding of exerkines and exercise <laughs> is that when you do aerobic exercise and you get your heart rate up, or when you do resistance training mm -hmm. and you lift weights and you get your heart rate up, there is about 9,000 metabolites that are released from a single bout of exercise. 9,000 from, from your skeletal muscles alone that's, into the bloodstream. 9,000. That's spectacular. It's unreal. Go exercise. And so some of those go to your brain, some of them go to your liver, some go to your pancreas, some go to your heart. Mm -hmm. they, 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 it's this natural protection system. And I don't think we've evolved to defeat Parkinson's, but I think we've evolved 
to have this natural protecting mechanism to prevent many different diseases from happening. Hmm. Okay. That, that's my belief in it. And so there's some something going on in somebody with Parkinson's that over this period of time when their disease is developing, this neuroprotective mechanism, that maybe the person doesn't exercise, maybe they've stopped exercising, um, but there's some, something switches in the brain and that these neurons start to die mm. and, and your body can't respond. Yeah. And um, the section of the paper that I'm working on that we're writing together, mm-hmm. that I'm working on right now, is trying to figure out why could that happen. Right. Is there an age dependency? Am I much older than you guys? <laughs> Do I make fewer extra kinds? The answer mm. is yes. As adults get older, they become they can become frail. They can have something called sarcopenia, mm-hmm. and their muscle mass starts to waste away. Right. That's a real bad thing if your skeletal muscle is really an important part of your it's not making exerkin network. Right. And that's another part of the paper I'm working on right now because there is a difference when they measure normal people, people with frailty, people with sarcopenia. Mm-hmm. So as you, sadly, as we get older, we start to atrophy if mm. you're not active. Right. If you're active, your muscle mass can remain the same or get bigger. Your exerkin levels are going to stay the same. Stay the same. And if there is a neuroprotective element of exerkins, as, as there is the suspicion, then there has that neuroprotection that lasts so much longer if the exercise is a part of the regular routine. Yeah. And, and so the, 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 the incredible thing about exerkines is that if you decide to make this change in your life, let's say you get a diagnosis of Parkinson's, hmm. and your physical therapist says, I want you to start exercising <laughs> four days a week, and you know, I want you to do this exercise program, I want you to do this weightlifting program, I want you to start walking or start mm-hmm. swimming, whatever you want to do, you need to do this five, six days a week. Right. And if you can do it for five years, you may slow it down. Mm-hmm. It's a lot to ask sometimes. I've, I've been on these committees, where I've, not committees, these, these programs where I've been volunteers for mm-hmm. an exercise program called Power Moves. And people will come in and say, I'm not going to sit on the ground. I'm not going to sweat. I haven't sweated since I was in elementary school. And oh. took <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do it now. So there, there are just a lot of people in this mm. world that just will not exercise. Right. Right. We run into that problem as PTs often, too. Yeah. How do you get buy-in from someone that hasn't exercised since they were in physical education? <laughs> so that natural part of their protective mechanism, these exerkines, will never be there for them. Hmm. And But it's not, you can't blame them. I, I read a paper recently that one out of three of adults never exercise one out in of the three. world. Gosh. They don't want to. Wow. Or they don't have time to. Boy, that's a higher percentage to. than More I would have More than thought. one out of three, something like 40%. Golly, okay. The thing that, to me, no matter how well-read this paper is that we were writing together, that physical therapist or that neurologist or that occupational therapist or that trainer has got to convince that person mm-hmm. exercise is good for you. Right. And if you can do that... You're halfway over the battle. Mm-hmm. Just convince them and, to move, right? You know, and, and I've never been a problem. It, motivation, I can see why people just aren't motivated to exercise. I get that way. I'm that way right now. I don't, I don't, <laughs> there are certain times you know, I just don't want to do it. You know, just, it. That could be the Parkinson's fighting back. Could be. Because this disease wants you to be lethargic. Hmm. It wants you to sit. Mm-hmm. All day long, and let him let let him do whatever he wants, and and you do nothing, hmm. and that's the worst thing you can do to have right. Parkinson's, you know, and and they're all kind of um, it's a it's a terrible disease for a lot of reasons, and we can talk about that later. But mm-hmm. it's it's really really a bad disease. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like a devil on your shoulder, just whispering in your ear, mm-hmm. "Don't don't do this." Don't do this. Keep saying it. Keep sitting down. Let me do the thing, and it'll eventually wear it down. 
That's yeah. awful. And it, it eventually will break down the barriers and it will win. Mm -hmm. And the stages of Parkinson's are scary because yeah. it, if you go stage one, two, and three are all relatively normal, four and five are just horrendous. Mm -hmm. the, the, are you talking about Honan Yar, the Honan Yar staging? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and they're, they're, they're horrible sounding. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people like that. I, I actually just, just had a friend die from Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And, but I've been to meetings before where you're surrounded by people with Parkinson's disease and they'll just run into walls because hmm. they can't stop. And it, it's so sad. It is. Or eating lunch with a, a couple, two sisters. And one of them is feeding her sister because she's got her Parkinson's progressed so much she can't she can't get out of a wheelchair, she mm. can't feed herself. Mm. And she was starting to have a hard time swallowing. Yeah. And you just like look at this going, how long have you had this disease? Mm. And yeah, you know, sometimes it's only been like five years. That's a lot of endurance. That's why I said, you know, everybody is so different because it just it, it latches on to you differently with every person. Right. And, uh, 40 different Parkinson's diseases, right? Practically. Yeah. Hmm. And so I, I think that for the most part, I'm 10 years in and I'm still doing pretty good. Whether or not that means it's not progressing very fast or I'm doing something right mm -hmm. or I'm just lucky. <laughs> and, um, Do you know what stage you are the Hone on the Honan Yar? I have no idea. I would assume you're in I mean, the two, one or two. two something probably. Yeah, but just curious. But the um, you know so the the neurologist does this pull down thing on you when you go when you go to see him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they send you out in the back of the, of the wall down the hallway, <laughs> and they say you stand in front of the hall and they're talking to you, and then all of a sudden they just grab you and pull. That's it. I know. And I've never taken more than one step. Awesome. In ten years. The perturbation test. Yeah. Is what it, that's called. It <laughs> so pisses me off when they do it. It's not, you know, you know it's coming, but you don't know when it's coming. You don't coming. know when it's coming. <laughs> That's and the point, though. Danny will say, I'll catch you. I'm going, sure you will. Sure you will. <laughs> but so I've, I've determined, yeah, and I've never fallen. That's great. Which is really, really a bad sign. I've known people that fall like once a day, once, once a, day. a week. Yep, yep. I'm like going, you're kidding. No, mm -hmm. no, no, I fall a lot. Wow. I'm glad you've never fallen. That's cool. In what ways... I, I liked this question, I'm curious of your answer. In what ways do you think your firsthand experience with Parkinson's enhances some of your understanding of the disease compared to other Parkinson's researchers mm -hmm. that don't have an experience with it? Well, because it, it was, I read something with the standpoint of, I want to learn about me right. from, from that paper. Uh, when my, one of my sisters was diagnosed with breast cancer, I switched part of the lab into cancer research because hmm. it, it so made me angry that one of my sisters had cancer hmm. that I was going to find the answer. Hmm. And that was a similar kind of thing I did with Parkinson's. I read a, a blog post about comparing Alzheimer's to Parkinson's, and they're very similar mechanistically, but they they different parts of the brain. Mm -hmm different parts of this and that, different proteins are aggregating. And uh, so the whole process is very different, but anybody that makes an advance on Parkinson's helps people studying Alzheimer's. Hmm. And anybody working on Alzheimer's makes an advance, helps people to work on Parkinson's because they're all neurodegenerative. Right. And uh, so I think that they share that common theme. And, uh, but so when I was diagnosed, I still had an active lab group. We were still publishing papers on thrombosis and on blood clots. And as I made this decision to phase out, hmm. I knew what I was going to do is scholarship on Parkinson's and just study what the mechanism was, how it relates to me, what and write papers on things that, that I thought, if it's helped me, it could help other people. Makes perfect sense. And that's sense. where we got started on the exercise and uh, different therapies, different yeah. modalities. And uh, so the very last undergrad in the lab group was the very first paper I had on Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. 
there was a thesis, it was a theoretical idea. And it's been, I've been kind of nice to see that other people have taken off on this hypothesis that we wrote about. Because we weren't, I wasn't going to study it. I wasn't going to get into the mouse brain or the human <laughs> brain like I had for, for thrombosis. We had done so much. It just was not going to be possible at my age and my career stage to, to actually write grants hmm. and switch the lab. Yeah. But I could write review articles about topics like that and, mm -hmm. and theoretical ideas. And that's how we got started. Um, I was going to ask you about partnerships that you'd work, you'd come up long, along the way as far as on your Parkinson's journey, some of those things that you've maybe worked with people and enjoyed a partnership or you know, all the other specific projects or studies that you've gotten to be a part of since no, the diagnosis, all the, all the too. papers we've done, I've done since I did the phase retirement. And it's a combination of Parkinson's disease, medical education, and active learning undergrad stuff. And every one of the most of those papers were been, have been authored by med students. But just for some reason, we just started talking. <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the kids played golf. Naturally. And I said, oh, wow. They were the natural part of our conversation. Of course. Off and exercise. Great lead in. Somebody else was already <laughs> working on a Parkinson's website, writing reviews for hmm. Parkinson's. I went, really? Interesting. So we wrote a paper on vitamin D. and That's right. That was that paper. That was okay. a great paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Mary Francis and I wrote two articles, one on integrative integrative medicine and, mm -hmm. and different drugs people take over the counter compound supplements combined with exercise and yoga and traditional pharmaceutical yep. use of drugs. And we were one about exercise and how exercise can be used to actually prevent COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that bothered me, no, scared me was COVID-19. Yeah, right. And we talked about this a little while ago, but, but someone with Parkinson's has got less, less viable lung function. Your autonomic nervous system is not working as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the risk of COVID-19 infection was, was increased, enhanced in people with Parkinson's. And it bothered, it scared me because I'd be teaching on UNC and Every undergrad on campus, I think, had it at one point. I, I, yeah, like a little petri dish at some point, you know. Yeah, and the med school was very large, and they, they, you know, it was it was everywhere for a year and a half or so. And um, it, so, so three or four of the papers that I've published on Parkinson's were always in relationship to COVID nineteen. Hmm. The one on vitamin D, we, we were like one of the first people to publish a paper that says vitamin D three can be used to slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease <laughs> and fight off COVID-19 infection because it fuels the immune system. It <laughs> fuels your immune system to help work against Parkinson's and prevent COVID-19 infection. Gives it a leg up. Very cool. And so we had so many people just took off on that paper and <laughs> it was really that kind of neat. Um, so those were two med students. Mm -hmm. And then I did the papers on, with one of my physical therapists on golf. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> love um, that. It's interesting because I found this obscure little paper in a Chinese journal hmm. that compared little old Chinese men that didn't do anything compared okay. to the age matched little old Chinese men that played golf. Hmm to the little old Chinese men that, had, that did Tai Chi. Really? Yeah. And the basic question was, who fell more often? <laughs> and, and the control See why group it was a bit of were falling paper, quite, but... <laughs> quite often. No exercise, no Tai Chi. Right. The golfers weren't falling at all. The hmm. Tai Chi people were not falling at all. So they came up with this idea that you know the golf swing, the, you use every muscle and joint in your body. Right. And it, it, you have to be balanced when you hit it. Your core is stronger. Your back is stronger. Yep. You're just more resilient to a falling. A big, complex yeah. compound movement. Mm -hmm. And so Frank had this idea that if you've got Parkinson's and you have this increased risk of falling, 
why not play golf? Yeah. And that's what the paper was about. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> it was great. Well, we talk about things in PT all the time of getting buy-in. You have to, you can propose all sorts of good ideas for yeah. recuperation and rehabilitation, but if it's not important to the patient, it won't get done. That yeah, was great. So Rebecca was a really smart person. She mm. wrote beautifully. Mm -hmm. And she did some really nice PT-related stuff about the golf swing mm -hmm. and the muscles and, and the 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 way it keeps you balanced, how it keeps you balanced, and we sent it to a sports journal, and it was actually pretty well received. I'm, Very I was good. really happy to see that. And Rebecca um, was your PT when you were still living in Chapel Hill yeah, to confirm. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. And then what else we have? Well, I had, well, I had it written down. And then yeah. I have your paper. Yeah. What are we writing about, Frank? We're writing about we're writing about the role of exercise. <laughs> That there's three parts to your paper. First part is what's the best way to exercise? Right. To have, if you have Parkinson's, to try and slow it down. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of studies. So let's say 20 years ago, mice and rat studies were showing when you give there's no there's no natural model of of Parkinson's for a mouse. Mm -hmm. They don't get it. But they you can manufacture it. A, a year it. old mouse is very old based on human years. Hmm. They don't get Parkinson's at all. And so you, you give them Parkinson's by injecting this neurotoxin in the right side of their brain. Hmm. And you put saline in this side. So there's your control. Wow. And in 20 minutes, they've got Parkinson's. They have tremors, they've got stiffness, they have all, every, the Brady the kinesia, known, all of it, yeah. Everything. And these little guys, you <laughs> give them a treadmill, they'll run off their Parkinson's. <laughs> we, we figured they, they could run about five miles a day. And if you give them a treadmill, they will run five miles a day and they will get rid of their Parkinson's in a couple months. That's so It wild. just goes away. Neuroplasticity. It just takes over, and, and they, they can repair, rejuvenate. They're normal mice. So the, but the mouse models are flawed because they're models. Right. And there's, they're, there's just, they're just not perfect. Mm -hmm. And so human studies never agreed with the early mouse studies. Well, and it's kind of cruel to yeah. strap a human patient to a treadmill and make yeah. them run. They, they do that, though. 30 miles a day. If they <laughs> And so now they've, they've done enough well-controlled, well-designed clinical studies that they're showing that a relatively robust amount of exercise every day, aerobic, lifting weights, mm -hmm. doing something to try and build muscle, mm -hmm. flexibility, can help quality of life, first of all. Absolutely. It gets, gets, makes it much better. And over time, can slow the progression to some extent. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that means it's neuroplasticity and you're regenerating that tissue. Right. But at least it means it's being neuroprotective and it's not getting worse. I've always said that if this is the worst I get, I'm okay with that. Hmm. Yeah. If I can stop it. You know, if I know 10 years from now I'm going to still be like this, that's okay. I can deal you with can that. Live, yep, you could live with that. Um, for the most part. But I think that's the thing that what we're trying to do, in my mind, mm -hmm. what, I, what I want our paper to recognize and, and to represent is, number one, here's a list of all the good things about exercise, and here's the kind of exercises you should do that most physical therapists agree, or neurologists agree, this is what would be helpful for you to control your dis disorder. Right. Mechanistically, it relates to exercise and the physiology changes, cardiorespiratory input going up, better circulation of blood in your brain, mm -hmm. better control of your insulin results. All these different things happen because you're exercising. Yep. And you're increasing your volume, upregulating of oxygen. all sorts of things. And these extra kinds aren't new; they've been around probably a hundred years, but they didn't realize that they were part of the exercise paradigm. 
and now they're called, if they're from smooth mu through skeletal muscle, they're called myokines. Hmm. If they're from heart, they're cardiokines. If they're from liver, hepatokines. Every organ, every tissue has these little substances that are evolved and secreted into the bloodstream <laughs> as a consequence of exercise. Skeletal muscle makes up 40% of your body mass. I didn't realize that. I didn't either. 40 to 45%. And so every time you move, you're potentially releasing extra kinds. And so doing it constrained wise or doing it repetitively by walking, you have this considered effort of these extra kinds to be released. A bunch go to your brain. Indeed. How they get past a blood-brain barrier, that's a mystery to me. <laughs> they shouldn't, but they do. And they, they flood into the brain. They activate all these different signaling receptors. And then you stop exercising and then they go away. Mm -hmm. You go back the next day and you exercise again. Here comes this new rush. Of they come back. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's enough data to say that it is neuroprotective. Most people will not get Parkinson's, hmm. but some do. Right. So there's something different about me versus somebody else who's never going to get it. Hmm. Um, and then you get this diagnosis and you say, okay, you're going to have to really crank it up and do this. And then that's the neurorestoratory property, the mm -hmm. ability to re-engage that neuron to make more nuclei, to make more mitochondria, to make just regenerate itself. Right, upregulate. And relearning that, that plasticity is incredible, because th that was something when I was in school was never thought could ever happen. Right. It seems like it's the last 30 years that the idea that we have neuroplasticity has really taken off. But it's, still, it's still the hardest part of the aspect of, of the process, because it may or may not work. Hmm. But I think the hope is that at least you've put an end to the progression. Right. Maybe you've kind of like slowed it down. Um, so, and this might, you know, I don't. I don't need to publish any more papers. <laughs> You've done a lot of writing over, over of writing your over career. career. <laughs> I don't need another grant funded. Um, and so this has really been a laborious process so far, mm -hmm. and we're not even done yet. Nope. Um, but I'm learning a lot. You know, mm -hmm. so to me, I've always thought if I can learn something, I could turn around and make somebody else learn it the way I teach. And Active learning. That's what my thought process in writing the paper. Mm -hmm. I'm not writing this for the neurologist. I'm writing it for the normal person, a person with Parkinson's. That's fairly sophisticated. But they can read this paper and say, oh, crap, I need to start exercising. Right. And this is why. Mm -hmm. and, and, but actually believe it. Yeah, yet another I can, bit I can of evidence. I make them believe it. I can just say, this is what I think is going on. This is, this is what we think is important. This is how you should exercise, we think, mm -hmm. based on reviewing the literature. And it'd be so cool just to learn to not just, as someone who's still a student in many ways and will continue to be a student even as I learn, I hope, I hope to always be learning, but as becoming a clinician, just to know that there is a little bit of something that I might be able to understand going on on the nitty gritty level for patients. Because you never know that, you never know what's gonna be the final convincing thing for folks that if you're trying to convince them that exercise is the right way to do it. I, there are some people who will just believe me just at that, but there are others that doing that education piece and saying there's so many ways that we don't know why exercise works, but here's so many possibilities. It's kind of a beautiful thing that our bodies know how to do this. There, there's so much possibility to it. No, I mean, I, I agree. I keep thinking that should this paper be a part A and part B paper? <laughs> because they're so, they're so different. The kind of exercises you should be doing mm -hmm. versus here's the, the mechanism of an extra kind of right, right. And, and I keep thinking no one's ever done these together. Mm -hmm. I read papers the past couple of weeks, hmm. all about extra kinds. No one's really mentioned exercise. Hmm. Then we always people on exercise, right. you know, and they're comparing weightlifting to, to, to swimming. Or mm -hmm. Tai Chi to salsa yeah. dancing to what have you. Yeah. And so I keep thinking this is going to be a complicated paper to review, but I don't want to break it up into two papers. I've done no. that before. Okay. And then it was kind of a cool goal to do what we did. Mm -hmm. That was 30 years ago we did that. <laughs> um, in a really good journal, we wanted to have an A and a B, hmm. and we did it. Very good. Um, but it was like so nerve wracking. I don't want. I want to put these two together, make one good long paper. That's right. And then you have this document that says exercise and extra kinds are good for you. Yep. And if you've got Parkinson's, it's especially good for you. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, just to kind of land the plane, I've got one more question for you. So this this interview, of course, is just because I love chatting with you, but also it's for targeting physical therapy students who might not. Who, who will have opportunities inevitably to hopefully work with people with Parkinson's. What advice would you give to them knowing a little bit what you know and they might not have personal experience with it yet? I think the most important thing to realize is that they're all very different from each other. It you, depends. May, you may encounter somebody <laughs> very young with Parkinson's. It's very different with the same person with Parkinson's, very old. Hmm. And their, their body may react differently. Um, 
that, that, that's the thing that surprises me because it's so different from everybody. And, and, but to, to realize that it's still the same basic disease, mm. the finish line, the starting point, are all going to be about the same, except they have a different trajectory. One person may be going faster, a lot faster. Mm. One person may be going very slow. And so it, it's the luck of the draw, I think. Um, and I don't, I don't know if, if we are predetermined to say I'm going to be a fast progressor mm. or a slow progressor. Is it, your, is it the fact that you're belligerent and, and you just don't want to give up and you're stubborn and bullheaded like I am? Does that, does that matter? I don't know. Um, Might not hurt. I mean, I think, I, I think it does. Um, then I think, I think if, if, you, if you're a physical therapist and someone comes in and says, I've got Parkinson's, then I think you've got some homework to do hmm. because there's a whole other set of ways to exercise somebody with Parkinson's. It's not as simple as somebody coming in with, my neck is stiff. Right. Or I tore a rotator cuff playing yeah. pickleball. And <laughs> because, you, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you may have to have them in, at their peak of their dose of their drug. Right, yep. On or their the, own. If the drug's coming down, you know, you have to take, take a break, let them take some more medicine. Mm. And um, it, it's really, you have to, you're very dependent on what the drugs are doing mm. and, and how you respond to these drugs and uh, how your brain responds to them. Uh, and I think to me, if if I had to pick a neurodegenerative disease to have, uh, I would not pick any of them. Right. But this might be the best one to get hmm. because That's a hot we, take. Have, we have some therapy that actually works to treat the motor symptoms. Right. And you can't say that about any other degen neurodegenerative disease. Right. It's so sad about Alzheimer's that to have you know young cognitive problems like that and, and to lose your brain, lose your thought, not know who you are, and your memory. Right. Um, my neurologist once said that, that I will always remember who I am. Hmm. I'm going, oh, I hope so. I hope so too. You know, your, your cognition is really still strong, really good, but it, if it shouldn't affect you differently. You can have cognitive effects with Parkinson's, but somebody else, because for you, that does not seem to be your problem hmm. yet. I think it would be a really cool thing for physical therapists to want to spend part of their career we're dealing with Parkinson's, mm -hmm. um, because it is a movement disorder, first of all. And you would not believe the amount of good physical therapists have done for me and um, I've had, I've worked now with five of them. And some in California, some in Arizona, some in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and actually one in, one here. That's oh. just spectacular. And uh, so I think the attitude of a physical therapist, if they can understand something about Parkinson's, mm -hmm. they could really, really help that person. And because you can't believe what it feels like to work out for an hour and to not be stiff. And you walk into that physical therapy room and they have focused their hour on you, and hmm. when you walk out, you're feeling almost normal. Hmm. There's no other feeling like that. And, and the physical therapist can make you do that. They can make you do the exercises. They can make you do the stretch. They can help you do the stretches and help you do the exercises. And I can't imagine how gratifying that must be from the physical therapy mm -hmm. standpoint to know how much you've helped that person. Right. And, uh, so I think it'd be very rewarding to be not solely focused on Parkinson's, but at least have that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be very beneficial and a win-win scenario for, this, for the physical therapist and the patient. I've said, I would certainly agree. I hope I get the chance to go into some of the special stuff. I want to listen. I want to try the power moves. I want to try. I mean, there's so much good that we know we can do. I did want to talk about I your write about all kinds of things. <laughs> um, I write about all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, from very important science to very not important stuff like songs and music that I <laughs> Encouragement. like. Encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, and I had this bout of not being able to sleep, which is one of the big problems with Parkinson's is your ability to sleep. And I kept had a couple sleepless nights, and I wrote down all my favorite Eagles songs, <laughs> and all the favorite lyrics from all the songs. And everyone, Rank them and everything. I, I saw people say, that was the greatest blog I oh thought about that song. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. People yeah. were grateful for the deep cuts. Oh, were, yeah. <laughs> but I spent two solid nights just replaying all these old Eagles Eagle songs. Mm. And uh, so the, the blog has been very, I think, really, really important for me professionally and personally because it's my new academic Hmm. setting. It's what I do instead yeah. of being a teacher, being a scientist, being a researcher. I write a blog. Mm -hmm. um, so I, spend, I spend a lot of time writing things. Um, one of the interesting things about Parkinson's, it could be an autoimmune disease. Hmm. And that really shook me. Hmm. I it's an interesting never really heard about that. Right. But the immune system can be a little bit haywire. And you could be making antibodies and making an, your attack on your own dopamine, dopaminergic neurons. And so those are the kind of things I read about. Right. Um, I'm right now I'm reading about that was the bare flex response. Hmm. And so when you lay down on the ground and you're flat, I get dizzy. Hmm. And because your, your blood pressure system is made to keep you balanced. When you lay down, most people don't get dizzy. Right. But most people with Parkinson's have got a little bit of disturbance with their 
the circulation system. Hmm. And so you lay down, or you put your head lower than your waist, you may get dizzy. Interesting. And some people have it, some people have it really bad. Huh. And, um, I actually haven't heard of that. It's yeah, really so, interesting. so if you're a physical therapist and you have a Parkinson's patient, you get them to lay down, they go, oh, wait a minute, I'm dizzy. Uh, yeah. You know what the problem is. Interesting. Have them like on a mat table and that might happen. Um, huh. and, and you can lower your blood pressure or you can raise your blood pressure, I forgot. Huh. Yeah, you gotta raise it. Yeah. And that's something that you're able, the information you can, as you're researching, yeah. disseminate it out on the blog. Yeah. I'm sure the networking is wonderful, so, too. You know, a few people have written about it. That, that, okay, when you write about this, I said, <laughs> I'll learn about it first. Yeah. And, <laughs> Get me on the starting chronic, block, right? Chronic pain is the one that I've been trying to read about for about a year. Because hmm. there's, there's a lot of problems with, with Parkinson's leading to chronic, chronic pain. pain. Hmm. And when you think about it, you're continually stiff, no matter right. how loose you get, how flexible you become. This 20 minutes later, this is now stiff again. And is that contributing to chronic pain? And dopamine, upwards and downwards, is involved in all the different pathways of pain mediation. And I just don't understand it. My brain's just not working. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Oh, yet, geez. <laughs> It's really complicated, the whole pain <laughs> process, how neurotransmitters work. Yep, the pain and neuro matrix is be above my pay grade, for yeah, sure. I know it's above mine. Mm -hmm. So once I figure it out, I'll write a blog about it. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, so, so I, I, do, I do funny things, but I'll spend too many hours working on it. Mm -hmm. You say too many, but... You're yeah. a retired guy. You said weekend warrior, so. Kind of all the time in the yeah. world, yeah. Yeah, that's right. There's nothing else to do. <laughs> yep, and you stay up late too, so what else? You could keep writing a blog. <laughs> <sighs> do you just follow blogs and whatnot too? Blogs and other journals and everything just to keep um, the research up to date? Yeah, I follow the blogs. Yeah, there's a lot of people a blog about mm -hmm. Parkinson's. Um, Mine is routinely rated in the top 20. I don't know, hey. how, they, I don't know how they rank them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm on Stanford Medical Center's website for neurology. Really? Disorder. They, they like, they love my, oh. my blog. Um, well, I got to get to work then. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see. Um, so I, I get these ideas for writing papers, mm -hmm. and then like I flesh out the idea, and, that's, uh, and I find the people who help me write the papers. Yep. Um, I've written a f several papers by myself, but th they're not nearly as much fun. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I like the team mentality much more. Yeah. It's much more fun to write it with oh, other yeah. people. So, uh, it's, it's much more viable and, and a better concept to have other people write, help you write. And, but the literature, there's just so much going on on Parkinson's and exercise, you name the topic. Yeah, yes. That I think I will never run out of ideas to. Gosh. Okay, final words. I can't think of anything else to tell you guys. We've talked about a lot. We did. I know. Got a lot of good stuff here. I'm perfectly happy to wrap it up there, but wanted to give you the metaphorical mic to wrap it up any way you wanted if you wanted to. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Just don't give up. Sounds good. But that's the thing. My advice to everybody with Parkinson's is be persistent. Don't give up, no matter what. Listen to your PT. Listen yeah. to your neurologist. And if you're a phys physical therapist, you may take you a while to develop the program for that Parkinson's patient. Uh, they may have frailty. They may have all sorts of something, something, other things going on. It doesn't stop other diseases. Since I've been in North South Carolina, I've now been diagnosed with arthritis in my hips and my mm. knees. <laughs> so I have this added stiffness and added pain, and that's why I need to go see a physical therapist. Not because of my Parkinson's, because right. of my hip is sore. <laughs> and you know, I may need, need a new hip. I may need a new knee. And, and so it doesn't stop other things from happening. Right. And uh, we forget about that, you know. I, I, all I do is complain and talk about having Parkinson's, but there may be other things going on that, that you know, are slowly 
creeping up on me. Mm -hmm. The comorbidities yeah. that complicate things. <laughs> yeah, and and so it, it's it's important. Don't give up. If you're a student, get your, get your degree. Physical therapist. If you get a Parkinson's patient, they may be a real big problem initially. Hmm. Get their program developed. Get them to do it. Get them to to like it. But once you get them liking it, they're not going to give up. They'll get better. That's encouraging. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you hosting. Great to see you, you in South Carolina. Yeah, Thanks. I know. It's good to be here. Thank Thanks you for, for all this too. You're welcome.